this is a weird question, but do you consider me a real human being? You've heard my voice, but you've never seen my face and I hope you never will. I can describe to you how I look, but would that help? Well, let's try anyways. I have two arms, two legs, a head, two eyes, and hair on my head, but my arms and legs are smooth and hairless. My skin is brown, my nose is stubby, I have a mole on my upper ass, and I can't grow any facial hair. The hair on my head is quite dense, straight, and jet black with gray speckles here and there. I'm really short, even for my people, and the highest compliment I've ever gotten is that I'm cute, whatever that means. Did that help humanize me at all? Am I more human to you now? Or would you need more of my story to fully humanize me? I can certainly do that, given that I have this platform to tell you my story, but I'm not going to, because I'm just gonna hope, maybe fruitlessly, you'll see me and billions of others who do not look like you as real human beings regardless of our story or background. And yet, there are some people who cannot be convinced that I am a human being. They would take a single look at my skin color and declare me subhuman. They would ask about my parents and their religion and call me a vermin, a rat, or a disease. They would so casually deny the humanity of literally billions of people, as if we're completely different species. A species of invaders, carrying diseases or bringing chaos wherever we exist. Let's do another scenario. Say, for the sake of argument, it's 2050. The world is ravaged by climate change, food shortages are rampant, starving people are everywhere, but somehow capitalism is still going strong. Let's pretend you're a soldier sent by a western country to, I don't know, let's say Thailand, to contain a new socialist ideology from spreading all over the world, let's call it, I don't know, super communism or something. One day, you are sent to patrol an area. The street is empty. You can barely hear anything. It's high noon, and the sun is just straight up roasting you alive. As you suffer the intense heat of tropical summer, you see a movement in the corner of your eye. You run towards it, and suddenly, we meet. You with your rifle slung on your shoulder, and me with a backpack on my back. We lock eyes, you raise your rifle, and start yelling at me to raise my hands. To your surprise, I start speaking English, though, with slight accent. With my hands up, I tell you that I'm a civilian, scavenging for food in this godforsaken, war-torn hellscape. Your rifle is still pointing at my head, unsure of what to do next. So, what do you do? Really think about it, and imagine the context surrounding our interaction. You've been told by your superiors that all brown people in the country are potential threats. Your media has been dehumanizing brown people for quite some time, even before the invasion. Super communists are portrayed as savage, inhuman, and brutal creatures. And you can't tell whether a brown person is a super communist just by looking. The tall tales of the cruelty of the super communists have been a staple in your movie for years. And your people are always the liberator, the good guys, always, always. So, would you shoot me, then and there? After all, you think you're one of the good guys and I could be a super communist. I could be dangerous, I could be anything. But I am still human. And assuming you're not a psychopath, how could you hurt another human being? How could you kill another human being? And in the worst case scenario, how could human beings exterminate millions of other human beings seemingly without remorse? Well, these are extremely complex questions with extremely complex answers. But an important part of it has to do with dehumanization. So, with that in mind, let's jump in and talk about... We need to take these people on. They are often connected to big drug cartels. They are not just gangs of kids anymore. They are often the kinds of kids that are called super predators. No conscience, no empathy. We can talk about why they ended up that way, but first we have to bring them to heel. And the president has asked the FBI to launch a very concerted effort against gangs everywhere. No conscience, no empathy. Those were her exact words. This is Hillary Clinton using dehumanizing language to justify her husband's 1994 Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act. With those simple words, she removed the humanity of a group of people by explicitly saying they lack conscience and empathy, and in their place, replaced them with animalistic characteristics. The word super predator conjures an image of dangerous animals that need to be exterminated, or at least tamed. And that's also exactly what she said, we have to bring them to heel, which, based on my limited understanding of English, is usually used when talking about dogs, not humans. So, why do you think she needed to describe people like that? Surely, if Bill Clinton was morally justified in enacting harsher police enforcement, then there would be no need to dehumanize people like that. 
We'll come back to that later, but let's step back for a moment. What even is dehumanization? I mean, you probably don't know the exact definition of it, but you probably have an intuitive understanding of the word, at least I hope so. But roughly, dehumanization means making others as less than human by removing human attributes or qualities from an individual or a group of individuals. That's a good start, right? Nick Haslam, a psychologist from the University of Melbourne, lists those qualities and attributes and group them into two different categories. The first category is something that he calls uniquely human traits. To quote him, these are characteristics that define the boundary that separates humans from the related category of animals. Traits that belong to these categories are civility, refinement, moral sensibility, rationality, and maturity. When these traits are denied to people, they are said to be animalistically dehumanized, usually by replacing them with traits such as lack of culture, coarseness, amorality, irrationality, and childlike. The second category is human nature traits. To quote him again, these are features that are typical of or central to humans. Traits that belong to this category are emotional responsiveness, interpersonal warmth, cognitive openness, agency or individuality, and depth. When these traits are denied to people, they are said to be mechanistically dehumanized, usually replaced with traits such as inertness, coldness, rigidity, passivity, or fungibility, and superficiality. Okay, before I go on, it would be remiss of me if I didn't point out that this model seems a little bit ableist. Well, that's because it kinda is. I mean, a neurodivergent person who is not particularly emotionally responsive or warm is implied to be automatically excluded from humanist consideration. That's really problematic, and plus, we can't ever define humanness that is both totally inclusive, meaning characteristics that all human have with no exceptions, and exclusive, meaning characteristics only human have, i.e. excluding non-human animals. However, this model is used as a framework on how people dehumanize each other. It's concerned with how people perceive others when they are removed from humanity and what attributes are removed or added into an individual or a group of people. So I think this model is flawed, but believe it or not, it's the best that we have so far. I think for us to talk about dehumanization in a way that makes sense, the humanist aspect of it has to be broken down into smaller parts so that dehumanization itself is multidimensional instead of a black and white binary thing. There are other models of dehumanization, but most of them usually use a humanist definition that is really vague, making it difficult to talk about specific instances of dehumanization. So yeah, we're kind of stuck talking about dehumanization with a flawed model. Just keep that in mind. Oh, and one more thing, we can also do away with the whole humanist concept altogether, which I'll talk about in the end. So, if we apply this model to Hillary Clinton's speech, we can say she animalistically dehumanized criminals. What's worse, if we look at the surrounding context, this use of dehumanizing language is really, really racist. See, there have been many studies showing that Americans associate black Americans with animalistic traits. By using the term super predator, Clinton conjured up the image of black Americans as criminals because of the already existing association in the minds of the general population. This created some sort of plausible deniability if confronted on the racism of the language itself, though to be fair, she admitted her language was racist. On the other side of the humanization spectrum is the mechanistic dehumanization. Sexual objectification of women is an example of this. Objectified women are denied their agency and depth, and instead, their existence is represented in totality by an organ or two, namely their breasts or their genitals, which in turn also make the women replaceable because they're not seen as complete human beings. Another example of mechanistic dehumanization is, well, capitalism in general, where workers are reduced to numbers, portrayed as cogs in a machine, and made replaceable. I would argue that it is absolutely necessary for a functioning capitalist system to do this because commodification is a driving force in capitalism which includes the commodification of workers. Going back to the humanization spectrum, there are also two quantitative dimensions of dehumanization on this model, explicit versus implicit and absolute versus relative. Explicit dehumanization refers to dehumanization where the people are explicitly compared to non-human objects, while implicit dehumanization is more of a subconscious process that we have towards an outgroup. One particularly prevalent example of implicit dehumanization is infrahumanization. Infrahumanization is the subtle ways in which we think of in-group and out-group differently in terms of our humanness. The simplest example of infrahumanization is our tendency to not realize people outside of our in-group have secondary emotions. So for example, a white person might rationally know everyone experienced resentment as an emotion, but fail to consider it when thinking about black Americans. And this phenomena has been shown to be really prevalent, which colors how we think and relate to one another. The other dimension of dehumanization is relative versus absolute. This refers to the degree by which people are dehumanized. When a group is absolutely dehumanized, they are completely outside of quote-unquote being human. Their humanness is denied in totality, and therefore is outside of human moral considerations. 
This usually occurs in genocide, another form of ethnic cleansing, when the victims are stripped of all human traits, making violence permissible in the first place. On the other hand, relative dehumanization occurs when an outgroup is considered less human than the in-group, in that they are still human, but the outgroup is perceived to lack some human traits. Like infrahumanization, relative dehumanization is also quite prevalent. We usually perceive members of an outgroup lacking some human traits, especially when the outgroup is perceived to be hostile or somehow inferior to the in-group. The point I really want to get across in this first part is that dehumanization is not a binary thing. It's not the case that you were either dehumanized or not. Dehumanization is a spectrum along multiple axes that can manifest in many different ways. The one aspect that stays constant is that dehumanization always occurs to an outgroup. Dehumanization is also really widespread, though some forms of it are much, much, much more dangerous than others. So then, the next question is, how does this happen? How does it propagate through our society? And what is the relationship between our society and dehumanization? Well, for that, let's jump in and talk about... Okay, so let's do a little detour for a second. I have a couple questions for you. Is this a sandwich? Is this a sandwich? Is this a sandwich? Or is this a sandwich? Is this a sandwich? Is this a sandwich? So how do you know which ones of these are sandwiches? We can argue for days whether hot dogs belong in a sandwich category. I mean, we can list what attribute sandwiches should have and what attribute it shouldn't have. But in the end, the line between sandwich and non-sandwich objects are arbitrary. We get to decide what those attributes are because we invented this class of objects we call sandwiches. See, we have this innate tendency to categorize objects and delineate them according to certain criteria. In our minds, objects should always belong to arbitrary categories. We do this to everything. Natural versus man-made, black versus white, good versus evil. But reality is much more complicated than that. Categories are loose and without a definite line separating what belongs in it versus what doesn't. This is a very human phenomenon, and we all do it. It's part of our cognitive mechanism to make sense of the world. I mean, we do it to literally every object in the universe and beyond. This too happened when we interact with other humans. When we meet a new person, we have this tendency to put them in a category based on what we perceive to be their characteristics. Black, brown, white, mean, nice, asshole, smart, dumb, straight, gay, cis, trans, short, tall, skinny, fat, ugly, handsome, left, right, center, capitalist, communist, socialist, and so on and so on. Then we make subconscious decision on whether this person belongs in our in-group or out-group. And if a person is put in a perceived out-group, they are then imbued with whatever perceived characteristic that out-group has. And those characteristics might be dehumanizing as we talked about earlier. Okay, side note, I don't really like psychology studies that use personality quiz to divide groups of people by traits. Mostly because people are social beings that don't exist in vacuum, and therefore, these types of studies are severely limited in their scope. Having said that, I want to point out a fact established by numerous studies. In psychology, there's this trait called social dominance orientation, which is one of the strongest predictors of dehumanizing others. As in like full dehumanization, not just infrahumanization. People with high SDO trait support group hierarchies and inequality in society, view the world as a competitive place in which only the toughest survive, and express a willingness to discriminate against other groups in order to attain or maintain group dominance. It is hypothesized that people with high SDO trait dehumanize others to protect their place in the hierarchy. But it's important to note that those studies don't really look at the surrounding context of why some people might have high SDO trait. It's an individualistic theory and might lead some people to think dehumanization as a problem at an individual level, instead of a collective societal level problem. So, you know, it's kind of interesting, but just keep that in mind. So that's how dehumanization happens within human minds. But how does it actually spread as an idea? Well, for that, let's take a look at Ben Shapiro. Okay, so I hope I don't have to tell you that this tweet is really, really, really racist. But you might not realize it actually dehumanizes a group of people too. The tweet imbues a dehumanizing characteristics to Arabs by saying that they are, quote, like to bomb crap and live in open sewage. It portrays Arabs as uncivilized destroyers, who live in abject conditions not because it is imposed on them, like in reality, but because they prefer it. There's another thing here that might not be obvious. Ben draws a line between civilized Israel and uncivilized Palestine to justify Israel's policies. See, if Arabs are seen as humans, then Israel's policies are really quite immoral. And so, he has to draw a line between fully human Israel and less than human Palestine to justify the moral exclusion of Palestinians. That is, he needs to justify why Palestinians do not deserve moral consideration of rights and protections. This is one of the functions of dehumanization, and we'll talk more about it later. But for now, let's just continue. 
This is an example of how dehumanization occurs in the discourse, and there are many, many more examples of dehumanization in the media, including social media. And as a quick aside, I want to point out that everyone does this. It doesn't matter if they're left, right, center, from NCOMs to NCAPs, from Nazbols to Nazis, from neoliberals to Stalinists, we all do it. It's sort of how we function as humans. But, and this is really important, remember that there are different degrees of dehumanization. When leftists point and laugh at right-wing jagoffs by calling them bots or NPCs, that's also dehumanization. The implication here is that those right-wingers lack agency because they're repeating debunked talking points. It is not, however, a call to exterminate them. It is not a call to limit their rights. But when the Nazis called Jews vermin, or when Trump called immigrants animals, that's a whole nother level of dehumanization. It's a call to action, if you will. I mean, if there's a literal vermin in your house, you'd want to get rid of them, right? And the same with unwanted animals. As we'll see later, this kind of absolute or animalistic dehumanization is usually used as a pretext for ethnic cleansing and genocide. This is the type of dehumanization that we should focus our attention to and push against. This is the type of dehumanization that has been proven to be really deadly. Anyways, let's go back to dehumanization in the discourse. There's an academic article by Christian Tialaga called Prejudice as Collective Definition, Ideology, Discourse, and Moral Exclusion. In it, he argues that extreme prejudice towards a certain outgroup is not merely the product of human minds, but also a discursive process in the mind of the collective. So what does that mean? Well, it argues that extreme prejudice, which is required to justify action against an outgroup, is a product of social practices, argumentations, and conversation between people as a collective trying to solve perceived problems caused by an outgroup. Through these processes, prejudice ideas are formulated, reformulated, resisted, or internalized, while drawing upon and updating historical prejudices of the past. If internalized, this idea crystallize into personal beliefs in individuals, which then colors the discussions and argumentations of said individuals, and continue the cycle in the discourse. These processes then shape what beliefs and actions are acceptable and normal within society. As an example, one of the studies cited in the article points out how, back in 2008, racist metaphors and parodic imitations of Spanish, Arabs, and Latino accents in American everyday discourse are not even perceived as racist because they are ingrained in ritualized discursive habits and social practices and folk theories of race and racism. So it wasn't seen as racist to do what we now perceive to be racist, at least for some people, back in 2008, precisely because those things are normalized through the collective discourse. I think this is a very interesting framework that can be used to analyze a broad range of subjects, but let's pull back. Looking through this lens, then dehumanization, which is closely associated with extreme prejudice, also becomes a process within the collective as it becomes the justification for certain actions when trying to fix a perceived problem caused by an outgroup. Dehumanization spreads from one person to the next through discourse, through various communication channels, whether that be the news or social media, the form, type, and degree of dehumanization changes. What starts as something mild might mutate into something vicious and dangerous as the collective tries to solve a perceived problem. When it's normalized in the minds of enough people, it becomes normalized within the collective. However, I think there's one thing missing from this framework. It doesn't take into account the power difference between people, and more importantly, between people and institutions. Institutions and people with power and influence can more readily normalize dehumanization within the discourse. For example, violence against marginalized groups, whether that be people of color, LGBTQ plus community, or immigrants, is often justified with dehumanizing language. We can often clearly see a connection in the usage of dehumanizing language between influential people and the perpetrators of violence against said groups. Dehumanizing language against Muslim, used in Christchurch Shooter Manifesto, is identical to that of influential people such as Stephen Molyneux and Lauren Southern. These influential people are able to affect the discourse much more effectively than a regular person without a following. And the fact that there is an audience for them means that this dehumanizing language is seen as acceptable, at least in some circles. Institutions, on the other hand, can shape the discourse by setting what language is deemed acceptable, while also steering it by choosing which groups should be talked about. So for example, the American news media legitimized the government's efforts in Afghanistan during the war on terror by using dehumanizing language against the Taliban. The media set the language on how Taliban soldiers were talked about in the news, and thus how people in general talk about the Taliban. This set the standard on what was deemed acceptable to say within the larger discourse, while also focusing it on certain groups. And the problem got a whole lot worse in the social media age. Now, dehumanization is a tool to get social capital, especially in the bigoted sections of the internet. So people who seek social capital are incentivized to dehumanize others. 
Like, a would-be TERF has to use dehumanizing language to describe trans people to be accepted in the TERF community. This perpetuates dehumanization of certain groups in the discourse within that community, and if that community is influential enough, then the use of dehumanizing language will spread out of the community and into the larger discourse. But why is that? What purpose does dehumanization have? Well, for that, let's talk about... So when I say functions of dehumanization, it should be really obvious what those are, right? People dehumanize each other to justify actions that are deemed immoral against an outgroup. Sure and simple. Except it's really not that simple. I mean, ask yourself this. Why is it even necessary to dehumanize the outgroup before violence is enacted upon them? Isn't that kind of weird? Like, we don't recategorize cows as something less than cows before slaughtering them. No, we just slaughter them. We know they're cows, there's no need to lower them within the hierarchy that we've built, with humans at the very top. So what's up with that? To answer that, let's construct a hypothetical situation. Let's say we, both you, my dear viewer, and I, live in a prosperous country, where most citizens live comfortable lives. Our country is a democratic country with a strong rule of law, a relatively corrupt free government, and with strict adherence to human rights. Everyone have fulfilling jobs that they enjoy with plenty of leisure time outside of work. Food is cheap, entertainment is abundant, crime is low, and everyone is healthy and attractive somehow. Unbeknownst to us, however, that prosperity is built out of the suffering of the neighboring countries, say through violent exploitation. Most people truly have no idea the suffering our country causes to our neighbor, and some are willfully ignoring it. However, our leaders are fully aware of the suffering we're creating, but they like power, and to keep that power, they have to do everything they can to keep the train rolling. One day, our neighboring countries have had enough and erupt in revolutions. Now, our leaders would like to keep their power, and to do that, they would need to subdue the revolutions. And so, they need to convince the people of our country that violence against the neighboring countries is legitimate. But here's the thing, if they straight up tell our people what was really going on up until that point, with all of the violent exploitation we've been doing, people might side with the revolution. After all, don't they also deserve rights as we do? But more than that, saying violence against them is legitimate is different than saying we should do violence against them. One is saying it is okay if we enact violence against them, while the other is we should enact violence against them. Our leaders would need to motivate us to enact that violence against the revolutions, on top of convincing us it's legitimate. So how can the leaders legitimize and motivate the violence against people who are essentially trying to defend themselves? First, an other is constructed. This is usually as simple as pointing out how people in the outgroup is different in some way. It doesn't even have to be true, as long as it delineates who belongs in the in-group and who belongs in the outgroup. Individuals within the outgroup are then essentialized, meaning they're not seen as individuals anymore. Rather, the group's perceived inherent characteristics are ascribed to all individuals in the outgroup. In other words, this is essentially instilling prejudice against the outgroup. Then, a narrative is built, and this is where dehumanization becomes a useful tool. Through the dehumanization narrative, the victims are excluded from moral considerations. This means ignoring the morality of certain actions, victims' rights, and other moral considerations, so that any and all actions deemed necessary to fix the perceived problems are morally allowed. But more than just relabeling victims out of humanity, this narrative also needs to relabel the actions against the victims so that the violence is seen as legitimate. So for example, invasion is changed to liberation, torture is changed to enhanced interrogation. This narrative then spreads through the discourse, through institutions and people, and changes the constraints of collective and individual expression of violence. As an aside, in the context of narrative building, there are two functions of dehumanization. One is legitimizing dehumanization, and the other is motivational dehumanization. As I've said earlier, legitimizing dehumanization concerns with why violence is acceptable, while motivational dehumanization is why violence has to be enacted. Referring to Jews as units or pieces, as the Nazis did, allowed them to enact violence against Jews, but it did not motivate them. On the other hand, referring to Jews as germs or disease, as the Nazis also did, motivated them to enact violence because it implied threats that had to be exterminated. It's important to note that dehumanization may be legitimizing without being motivational, but when it's motivational, it is always legitimizing. The perceived threat posed by an outgroup motivates violence while also legitimize it as self-defense. This is the main difference between motivational dehumanization from legitimizing dehumanization, the presence or absence of threat to the in-group. Okay, let's go back to our hypothetical scenario. Let's say our leader successfully built an other out of the neighboring countries, and they are trying to create dehumanization narratives against them. Day after day, we see the news telling us how terrible and evil the revolutions are. 
but they need either our support and participation or our indifference. Only then, when the majority of the population are either supportive or indifferent, can violence begins. Now, all this stuff I've talked about so far concerns dehumanization specific to violence in genocide and wars. I actually base most of it from the paper Modern Genocidal Dehumanization by Rowan Savage, which looks at how dehumanization functions in relation to genocide in the modern era. But can we generalize it to how dehumanization function in general? I believe so. But this video is already long enough and I'm already late on my video schedule. So let's keep it short and take a look at only two small examples, while also applying what we've learned so far. Okay, let's talk about capitalism. In capitalism, an other is built by dividing the working class against one another. A narrative of competition is then constructed so that the working class competes against itself. The workers are reduced to numbers, are likened to cogs in a machine, strip of their individuality, and become replaceable. This dehumanization functions as a legitimizing force for exploitation, though motivational dehumanization is absent because exploitation is not motivated through the dehumanization of the exploited. So capitalism blatantly, relatively, and mechanistically dehumanizes workers. Workers are still seen as humans, but corporations and governments talk as if workers are replaceable, akin more to robots than humans. Unsurprisingly, it is corporations and governments that set the language describing said workers, which spreads through the workers themselves, which then normalizes dehumanization and capitalism. The second example is imperialism. An other is built by demonizing a group of people as brutes, savages, or animals. A narrative is then constructed, usually involving keeping peace, fighting for freedom, or liberating the people. People who are dehumanized are then morally excluded, thus justifying any and all actions against the outgroup. The media then propagates this narrative by normalizing the portrayal of the outgroup as brutal, inhuman, animalistic, or irrational. This dehumanization also legitimizes and motivates violence against the outgroup. Remember that Ben Shapiro tweet? Well, that is this. Now, there are many, many more instances of dehumanization, both from the past and the present. We can talk about them for hours and hours, but let's move on and ask one final question. Are we stuck with this? Are we stuck with dehumanization for the rest of human existence? Well... Yep, we're stuck with dehumanization for the rest of human existence. At least I believe so, because humans can't help creating another in our minds. And as long as another can be created, they will be seen as less than human by the in-group. But maybe I'm overly pessimistic, I don't know. If you think otherwise, let me know down below. Or you can tweet at me, the link is also down below. Actually, tweet at me, because I rarely check YouTube comments. Anyways, that is not to say we can't make it less harmful or minimize it, though. Different groups of people living next to one another has been shown to reduce dehumanization. Humanizing portrayals of marginalized communities in the media also seem to work. I would argue the rehumanization of LGBTQ plus people, especially the LGB part and not so much the rest, succeed because their portrayals in the media post 2010s were positive. I mean, they weren't perfect, but in general, they were not portrayed as evil villains anymore. We still have long ways to go in terms of dehumanizing marginalized communities, but it's a start. Oh, one more thing. There's one radical idea that I will probably talk about in the future that I want to touch on real quick. Theo from Just Wondering YouTube channel, which is an excellent channel you should check out, replied to a tweet I posted about dehumanization. He said something along the lines of, Why do we exclude ourselves from nature in the first place? Why is humanness important in the first place? And that got me thinking. Dehumanization is, in essence, excluding a group of people from the category of human, kind of like how humans exclude themselves from nature. Paradoxically, maybe if the concept of humanness is completely obliterated, we can free ourselves from othering other groups of people, because now there is no delineation differentiating us and them. After all, if we're part of nature, then they are too, whoever we or they are. Will that work? Well, I don't know. But at least, you know, interesting to talk about. Hey, thanks for watching. Um, I apologize if this video took a while because this topic is really, really hard to write about. I had to like, you know, uh, research a bunch of other stuff that is kind of hard to, to read, I guess, because it's just kind of depressing. But um, yeah, thanks for watching. I'm not sure what the next video is going to be, but um, if you think I'm doing a good job, you know, like and subscribe and all that stuff. Go follow me on Twitter. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching.